Well, thank you. What a powerful song. That idea that we would offer everything, our full selves, to Jesus. And I think our posture about that, our willingness, our ability to do that, is really connected to what we believe to be true about Jesus. Our perspective on how we understand Jesus, his goodness, his lordship. And we're going to talk this morning about perspective about how our perspective on things, particularly in times like wilderness times, can really impact our posture. You know, they say, you've heard the saying that hindsight can be 2020, right? That there's uh, looking back on things, we can get a different perspective on reality, on the full story. There's things that we wish we maybe knew at the time. Probably if we could all tell a story about hindsight being 2020, some of those might be somewhat humorous. Uh, Some of those might be somewhat, somewhat painful. Hindsight, that perspective of being able to look back, can be a gift to us. And there's a lot of grace in being able, God giving us hindsight. But the story we're gonna look at and read this morning, I think offers a word of hope for us God speaking to us about what it might look like for him to open our eyes and give us that perspective in our present reality so that we might not have to wait until we get the perspective of hindsight. You know, we've been talking about we're in this sermon series about life in the wilderness and we've been using, Pastor George has been using this image of lifting our hearts and our hands up above the clouds, the gray, foggy, cloudy day of Seattle that we all know too well, and getting our hearts up above those clouds into the sunlight and sunshine. And you think about the image of that, getting up above the clouds can bring a perspective and clarity that we often are missing in the fog. In the wilderness, in the fog, Sometimes we can lose our sense of direction. We get a little bit disoriented. Sometimes in the wilderness, it's hard to see God's hand. It's hard to feel his presence. Sometimes when we're in the wilderness, we kind of lose our sense of where are we going in the first place and why are we going there? We can start to distrust and doubt God's presence, provision, and action in our life. This is certainly true of Israel. We see this in their, in their grumblings, in their wanderings. It's true for us as well. And so our story that we're going to look at this morning, this text we're going to look at this morning, is a word about how God, are, God intervenes in the midst of the wilderness to give us perspective, to open our eyes and to help us see. It's the story of Balaam and the donkey. It's a story about Balaam, who is a seer who couldn't see without the grace of God showing up to open his eyes and change his perspective. And as we go through this morning, I'm hoping that we can awaken, we can get some perspective on understanding God's intention for us, see a way of how God is at work in God's kindness, and consider how we might respond. Before we read this text, we need to do a little bit of context. So the Israel is at the end of their journey. It's the end of their wilderness time. They've been going through the desert and they're camped now outside of Moab. And the king of Moab is a man named Balak and he looks out of his balcony and he sees outside this mass of people. He sees Israel camped tribe by tribe. And he gets a little bit nervous at what this might mean for his country. And so he hires, he tries to hire this man named Balaam. Balaam is a seer, like a prophet or an oracle, who's known to have the power to speak a word of curse or a word of blessing. Balak and Balaam go back and forth a little bit as Balaam is deciding what he wants to do. And he decides that he's going to go ahead and go on to Moab and meet this king. And the story we're going to read about Balaam and the donkey is when he's on his way to Moab. I'll read it. It's a longer one. You can sit tight and I will read. But before we do that, let's pray 
and ask the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts. Holy Spirit, we are grateful for your presence here with us. As you opened Balaam's eyes, will you open our eyes as well to your word? May your word and you, the word, be living and active in us today. Speak, O Lord, we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. So our text comes from Numbers 22, verses 21 through 35. Listen now to the word of the Lord. So Balaam got up in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the officials of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the road as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey and his two servants were with him. The donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. So the donkey turned off the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn it back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it scraped against the wall and scraped Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck it again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would kill you right now. But the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey, which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I been in the habit of treating you this way? And he said, no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his drawn sword in his hand and he bowed down, falling on his face. The angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? I have come out as an adversary because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If I had not turned away, if it had not turned away from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let it live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I didn't know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, therefore, if it is displeasing to you, I will return home. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you to speak. So Balaam went on with the officials of Balak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you guys heard this story before? This is proof that the Bible is not boring, right? And I was, I'm really grateful that we at UPC now use the new revised standard version and not the King James version, or I would have just been bleeped out. I don't even know how many times instead of saying donkey. So somebody did suggest that I use, I try to figure out what a donkey talks like and that I say the donkey lines in that voice. I'm not sure whether I should apologize to you that I didn't get that figured out or say you're welcome for not trying to do that. But it is a funny story and it's intended to do what it is doing for us, to get our attention. That's what its purpose was for Israel. That's what its purpose is in the canon, is to get our attention, to be a larger than life story. So what's going on here? Well, first, just facts. Balaam is a foreigner. He's not an Israelite. He's a foreigner. He has this encounter with a living God. Balaam is a real person. They found limestone fragments um, in Jordan that they date to the 8th century that reference Balaam, son of Peor, seer of the gods. He's known to have the power to literally curse and bless people. And in this story, he, can't, he has an encounter with the living God. He talks about God as both Elohim, the more generic word for God, name for God, and also Yahweh, the covenant, uh, familiar name for God. Yahweh confronts Balaam 
opens his eyes and Balaam responds in repentance and obedience. But this story is not so much about Balaam, but it's about Israel. This story is intended for the people of God. They are the ones who hear it. We are the ones who hear it. Hearing about this foreigner's encounter with God in the midst of their wilderness experience. And again, its function is to get our attention and to speak into our life. Balaam is a seer who cannot see until God opens his eyes. Balaam, whose name literally means destroyer of nations, has no power to curse those who God calls blessed. And God speaks through both the donkey and to Balaam, and Balaam to the people of God. And I think this is what he is saying to us. He's saying, my intention, my plan, my commitment, my purpose is to bless you. And so at times in my grace, I will confront you. I will oppose your will and your way. I will challenge your perspective. And oh, how I hope you will respond with a soft heart in repentance. God's intention, God's plan, God's purpose is to bless Israel and to bless us, his people. And we start there because that's the context for where this story takes place. Let's talk for a minute about blessing. Let's unpack that word a little bit. We're not talking health and wealth. We are not talking prosperity gospel. We are not contestants on the Price is Right where we're gonna come on down and win a washing machine, right? We are not at Oprah's show where everybody gets a new car. God's idea of blessing is not a picture of us in front of palm trees on a beach with the hashtag blessed, right? So what is blessing? I understand it this way, that blessing is living in the presence and provision of God. The word blessing is, is strongly connected to the word shalom, which is used throughout the Bible. The word shalom is more than just this artificial peace. The word shalom talks about this deep flourishing, this holistic flourishing that's physical and spiritual and relational this flourishing of life. I often think about it in relational terms, that being blessed means living in reconciled relationships with God, with ourselves, with one another, with the earth. God's desire is to bless us, for us to live in the experience of God's provision and presence in a way that goes beyond our circumstances. God's blessing is always connected to being a blessing. God says that he will bless us so that we might bless others. See, this story about Balaam is rooted in God's intention to bless. Balak's intention, the king of Moab, his intention is to curse Israel. But God's intention, his plan, his purpose is to bless them. And he has the power to do this. And he's persistent in this plan. I think it's easy for Israel to lose sight of this, particularly in the wilderness. It's easy for them to forget the words that God spoke to them in, in Exodus 3. I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt into the promised land, into a place of my provision and presence. It's easy for them to lose sight even of how God's presence and provision, how his blessing is with them, not just in the promised land, but in the wilderness. In their wanderings, in the fog, they forget God's word and distrust his intentions. I think this is true of us, right? We can get disoriented. We can lose perspective and lose our way. In the grind, sometimes we can doubt and distrust the intentions of God. And it doesn't help that Satan has been recycling the same two lies from the garden. 
the same two lies. Did God really say? And is God really good? We hear these recycled lies in Israel's grumbling. And I hear those same lies whispered to me daily. Did God really say? And is God really good? We can get disoriented in the wilderness and begin to wander and fall victim to the promise of a mirage. I think it's the graphic that we've been using to describe this sermon series in the wilderness. It's, it's a beautiful graphic of kind of sand, barren land. And you guys know what a mirage is, right? From the movies where the actor is moving through the desert, really tired, really worn down, and they see off in the distance this lush green land, something that looks like an oasis that looks like a source of life. But as they get closer, that promise of life fades into a haze. A mirage is something that claims to be a source of life, of water, of hope, but leaves us thirsty, leaves us empty handed, hopeless, and wandered and away from where we need to be. On Israel's journey towards the promised land, they wander all sorts of ways, right? Not just physically, but spiritually, in their relationship with God, in the state of their heart, in their trust of God, in their faithfulness to him. And this is true of us as well. We sing in the 830 worship service, come thou fount of every blessing, that hymn that has this incredible line, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I am prone to leave the God I love. Now here's the thing. Indifference would leave us to our wanderings. Human rights activist and Holocaust survivor Ellie Weisel is credited with saying that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. See, God loves us too much to be indifferent to us. God loves us too much to let us wander. And so what we see in this story with Balaam is that in his love and in his grace, he will confront us. He'll confront us when our way is steering us wrong. He'll confront our sin, which in his love he hates. He's not indifferent when we're chasing a mirage or when we oppose his way of blessing. But in his love and grace, he will confront us. I got a visual image of what this looks like when I was traveling a bit ago. I was in an airport and waiting for my flight and there was this little girl who maybe 18 months, she'd clearly just learned to walk because this was she was really loving her new newfound legs, new ability. And she's walking up and down the aisles and her dad's chasing after her, following after her. And as she's walking along, she steps towards this glass that all of a sudden opens up. It's one of those doors, right? Where it senses your motion. And so she steps up to it and this door opens and she sort of looks around, backs up, it closes. She steps up again, it opens. She, of course, thinks this is the most amazing thing in the world. And she's sort of standing there tentatively, and then you probably know what happens next, right? She beelines into this room that's just opened up to her, and her, little, her dad runs after her, scoops her up, brings her back out, and tries to get her to keep walking up and down the aisle. But that's no fun. This magic door is way more exciting. And so she keeps stepping up to it and opening it. It opens and she runs in again. And pretty quickly the dad has none of this. And so he turns around in front of her, right? In between her and the door. She steps right, he mirrors. She steps left, he goes left. She, he stands in front of her and pretty soon she's, you know, stomping her feet like toddlers should be doing. And at some point he just scoops her up picks her up and carries her away and she's crying and he's ruined her fun. And it was humorous to watch, right? And there was nothing particularly harmful about what was in that room other than she wasn't supposed to be in there. 
But you can imagine that the humor fades away if that room is dangerous. If there's something in there where she really shouldn't be in there. The dad is protecting her. It triggered a memory for me of my own kids when they were little and learning to walk. We'd be out in outside, out around a campfire, a fire pit, and my kids were attracted to that flame. And so they'd wander out to try to grab it. My job was to stand in front of them and block their way. My kids have always loved the water. Anytime they get around water, they just want to head straight first into it. So their first time at the beach, there's massive waves roaring up and they're trying to run straight out into them. My job is to stand in front of them. My son, one time, I, we, were, he, we were by a pool and again, always attracted to water. And I wasn't paying very good attention and he ran straight into the pool Fortunately, my friend was paying attention, and so it's like a classic hoax story about when our friend Aaron jumped into the pool fully clothed to grab Daniel and get him back on dry land. Sometimes God's kindness looks like a mother picking up her screaming toddler who wants to walk into the deep end of the pool. All they can see and feel is opposition and not understand the kindness and the love. Sometimes the kindness of God looks like opposing our choices because it turns out that what looks like an oasis, what looks like life in the desert is actually a mirage, an illusion of something that will satisfy, but that will not only fade into haze, but will harm us by taking us off the path that will actually lead to life. God and God's kindness will confront us as he confronted Balaam. He said, I have come out as an adversary because your way is perverse before me. Balaam first responds in ways that I can certainly relate to. As God confronts him, he first persists in his way. He stubbornly stays the path. The donkey's wandering off, running him into brick walls, laying down, and Balaam persists in his way. I relate to that. And I'm really grateful that this is one of the many examples about God being being so patient with us. Right over and over again, God steers us back on the right track. God works in our life. Here it's three times, but I'm reminded of Jesus' words, 70 times seven, an endless supply of God's grace. But sometimes we keep persisting. Balaam also responds by experiencing shame, right? He says to the donkey, you have made a fool of me. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I, when, when I feel conviction, I feel shame. It's hard not to feel that sometimes. We don't like to feel exposed. And we know that that's not God's desire. That God's desire is to cover us and clothe us and wrap us in love. But sometimes our first reaction too can be shame. Balaam also responds in anger. We can get angry when our way is hindered, our will is impeded. This can sometimes be our first response to conviction. I know for me, when I notice myself getting angry with people at situations, I'm trying to train myself that that's a a trigger for me of noticing that something might be a little bit off in my perspective in my heart towards God. But within this story, God too persists in his kindness and God opens Balaam's eyes. This is something that God's grace does. See, we need the conviction of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes because sin can render us blind. Sin can deaden and harden our hearts. And like Balaam, it can cause us 
to cease being a seer. We need God's action, God's initiation, God's movement in our life. God opening our eyes to help us see clearly and to see what is true about God's intention, to see what is true about God's authority and our condition. Here, the writers use this idea of of Balaam's eyes being opened, literally and I think spiritually as well. In the Gospels, we get this incredible story about the prodigal son. And And the words used there are that the prodigal son came to his senses. God opens our eyes. God brings us to our senses. God acts in his love. God convicts in his grace. And we get to consider how we will respond. And here too, Balaam becomes our guide in how we might respond. He responds in confession and repentance, something that we practice in our liturgy every Sunday, our prayer of confession, turning our hearts towards God, which is always, I hope you notice, met with an assurance of pardon, God's forgiveness, God's mercy. So Balaam says, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, therefore, if it is displeasing to you, I will return home. It's a remarkable witness of repentance. Balaam's response is to tell the truth, to confess, to acknowledge the authority of God, and to be willing to change directions. See, as his eyes were opened, as Balaam's eyes were opened, as his perspective changes, he can understand this angel with a sword standing in front of him from the perspective of Romans 2, 4, that says, do you despise the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's kindness confronts us. God's kindness stands in front of us to block the door. He confronts us when we're going away that we shouldn't go or into a place where we shouldn't be or with an attitude or heart that will cause us harm. I don't know about what this might look like for you in your life, how you've experienced God's kindness convicting you, God's kindness changing your perspective. There have certainly been times for me where God's grace has confronted me when I'm heading down a wrong path, when I'm chasing a mirage, something that will not bring me life. And repentance has looked like changing plans, changing directions, changing relationships, changing behavior. And there have been times where God's God's work in my life has meant a reorientation of my perspective and my heart. Believing and trusting, seeing that God is not against me, that God's way is true, that he really did say, that softening my heart, turning the other cheek, bending my will to God, following the way of Jesus will lead to life. For me, repentance has meant both a coming to my senses and a turning back home towards God. Sometimes we need a change in our perspective to see that the mirage that promised life is actually the deep end of a pool or a fire that will burn us. We need the grace of God to open our eyes so that we can see his hand and trust his way. This certainly happens in hindsight. And again, there is much goodness and grace in that. But I know that I want to also grow in seeing God now. Many of you are reading through Immerse. And if you've been, I talk about my Immerse ahas. We've been reading through the New Testament uh, using the New Living Translation. And I'm finding that I'm reading these texts and I've read them before, but all of a sudden I have this aha moment, these immerse ahas. And as I read Balaam's story, I wonder if we might talk about how can we have a Balaam moment? How might we need a Balaam moment in our life? And not just a Balaam moment, but also a Balaam perspective. Again, not just in hindsight, 
but now. So as you sit here and as you go about your Sunday and week, maybe spend some time with the Lord to think about how you might need a Balaam moment or a Balaam perspective. What mirage are you chasing? How might God be being ask, asking you to turn your heart to him, to tell the truth and to change directions? How might God be inviting you to change your perspective? How do you need to grow in your trust of God? You know, God placed before Balaam an angel with a sword. God placed before us, all of humankind, his son with his arms spread wide, who spoke two words of grace to us, Father, forgive them. And he said, it is finished. This is the confrontation of God's grace. And as that hymn, Come Now Fount, goes, may this goodness, like a fetter, bind our wandering hearts to God, that we may hold tight to this in repentance and trust. If you need a Balaam moment this morning, We'll have a prayer team up front after the service. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, you can request prayer in the chat. If you want to move towards God in that way, we have folks that would love to come alongside you in prayer. I want to end this story where it began. This crazy, somewhat silly story about a talking donkey is a story of grace. Yes, it's about our response, but it begins and ends and soaked through with God's grace, God's desire and intention for us, God's action towards us on our behalf for our good. All around the story is God's intention and desire and persistence to bless us. I spent a lot of time in numbers as I was preparing for this. And in number six, my, my aha in numbers was number six, that famous blessing that God gives Aaron to speak over Israel was not spoken to them in the promised land. It was spoken to them in the wilderness. Spoken to us wherever we are, that this is God's intention. God gave these words of blessing to them. God gives these words of blessing to us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So will this put my name on them and I will bless them. Yes, God really did say this. And God really says this to you and me. And in this way, we are stuck with this blessing, with God's persistence to pour out his blessing, his presence and provision on us. And he will confront us in his grace to open our eyes and our heart and our perspective to draw us into relationship with him. And even if that means to change our direction. We pray with me. Lord, thank you for your grace that you did not withhold yourself, but pour out yourself to us. Pour out your goodness, your forgiveness, your mercy, your blessing on us. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive you more fully. Give us faith to believe that your words are true, that your desire for us to bless us is true and give us the courage to act with joy and confidence and live out the way of blessing that we might be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.